Okay, so we are back for our afternoon session. And um, the first thing, um, I just wanna lay out what the rest of our schedule for today should look like, similar to. Um, the first thing I wanna let you know is in traditional training for retreats, um, we're always taught that you should make your retreat like a barley seed, like a barley seed. Ooh, I can even draw this on the whiteboard here in Zoom. How fun. I love a whiteboard. Oh, man. Okay, am I already on draw? So there we go. So a barley seed looks kind of like that, right? Oh, let's see if I can let this person in. There we go. Um, so narrow at the beginning. Thick in the middle, narrow at the end, right? Kind of like the body type that tries to follow me into my 40s, which I'm trying to fend off uh, as best I can. But um, these are, so this is, this is the barley seed model, barley seed. Um, and this is, doesn't matter how long a retreat you're talking about. So if you were to do a three-year retreat, your first three months should be this kind of like gradual on-ramp, right? And then you've got like your middle year, oh, oh, so silent and quiet. And then, you know, your last nine months is like, you know, you're maybe you're doing the confession with the rest of the monks or, or whatever your tradition does instead of being just in the cave and you gradually accustom the mind to the next thing. So that's kind of what I'm doing with, you know, this thing of at lunch, you know, like, oh, get your mind accustomed to being conversational again, um, because you really want your practice to flow in these sort of smooth transitions when possible. Life will give you enough abrupt transitions that, you might as well take advantage of when you can create smooth transitions for yourself in meditation. So um, this is the barley seed phenomenon. And this is the same for if we're doing like a one day retreat, like a mini retreat. So as you'll have noticed, we came in, we did a little two to one breathing. I blabbed at you. Then we did a meditation session. Then I blabbed at you a little more. Then we did two meditation sessions in a row. And by that time, you're starting to get the cumulative effect. Um, and that settles you kind of into the deeper part of the uh, retreat. And your mind can really go down because you've got an on-ramp. So we're going to stay in the deeper part of the retreat. You know, it, if you had to go and, I don't know, run your internet social media channel on the break, uh, it may not work exactly the same, but you still, we do still have some of that cumulative energy. So we are going to, um, I might blab at you for a second, but we're going to do another couple of intensive rounds of meditation. And then as the afternoon progresses, we'll do a little more interactive, a little more theoretical mixed with some little, um, my Lama calls nowadays out of pocket practices, you know, so, so ways you can little one minute things you can do to take some of these, uh, core insights where we're steeping in and put them into real life, right? So does that sound good? That's that's my plan for the afternoon is continue the barley seed, continue the barley seed. So just for review, we are in the compassion alchemy meditation system. And this is just my best guess at creating a system uh, basically so you can have a nice basket that all the various aspects of meditative and transformative work can go into um, Zen meditation and mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is similar, but not the same and non-sleep deep rest and tantric inner alchemy visualizations and stuff. They're all in this realm of meditation and they can all be quite transformative, but they're not always integrative or each type is not always the type that you need at that time in your life. And so my hope this work in progress is really both to have a, um, a place to just kind of learn meditation and practice the various techniques, but instead of having them as a hodgepodge, 
having them kind of, you know, as a set of techniques that come with a map so that rather than struggling along in a, in a meditation style that will destabilize you and make you have more uh, discomfort in your life or be less effective at your job or less happy in your relationships, often there's just a thing of like, oh, instead of zenning harder, do some yoga nidra for a couple months, you know, or instead of yoga nidra-ing more, do some cognitive behavioral therapy. And we have, um, we have meditation styles that are sort of like cognates of CBT. We'll learn, we'll learn a bit today of, of looking at the mind. So instead of trying to go into a rarefied state, we're actually analyzing the contents of our mind. And this is an important meditative practice in Buddhist tradition, in Christian mysticism. Um, they take these where they're not trying to stifle the thoughts, they're letting the thoughts run and they're directing them in specific ways and encouraging them along certain lines. So all of these can be part of your meditative path, or if you don't mind the word, your spiritual path, or even you could say your path of human development. So we're in the Compassion Alchemy. Our last module was on the earth element. And that was all about, if you want a motto for that one, it's all about pleasure is good. Pleasure is good. Um, the recommended reading for that one is Buddha's Brain by what's his name? Um, Hansen, Rick Hansen. And um, the slogan you'll walk away from that book with, if you were to dilute it all down, is that we naturally are Teflon for positive experiences and Velcro for suffering but through meditative training, you can reverse that so that you become Velcro for wholesomeness, compassion, self-compassion, pleasure, and Teflon for judgment and self-abnegation and physical pain and, and all of this kind of stuff. So that's that foundation. And it's learning how to shine the light of your mind very specifically. Our mind is always granting significance. We're always choosing subconsciously or consciously where we what we foreground and so we learn to do that on purpose and that actually forms the basis for a lot of the work where you're really transforming deep patterns or you're using meditation for pain relief all of this comes from learning that you can shift what you foreground with your mind and what better way to do that than to practice that with pleasure so um, that's our first one, and it relates to early human, early people, baby development, where what you need is secure attachment. You need to be taking in a lot of experiences in a safe environment. Um, you need to be nourished. You need to be comforted. You need to be comfortable so that you have a big well of that resource that then you can go and adventure from. So um, then now we're on an adventure. A little bit. Now we're on the adventure. So uh, we moved from the stable earth element that we created. And if you didn't take that course yet, that's fine. You can get in the water and go back on land later. No problem. Um, but now we're we're taking a swim and we're going to find out what's in the depths. We're going to get noodly and, and liquid. A book or a, um, a resource that you might enjoy for this is actually another of Rick Hansen's, um, which is an audio set called The Enlightened Brain, The Enlightened Brain. And in that, he goes much more in depth into um, kind of the neurology of approach and avoidance in the mind and kind of the chemistry and um, how Hebb's Law, how you can train your uh, plastic neurology to be to enter into meditative states more regularly. Um, but he also talks about in that he gives a lot of great examples of how to train concentration, how to deepen the meditative state of focus, of foregrounding the breath or foregrounding whatever object of meditation you want. And that is where we are at in our study for today. We've learned that this is all based on relaxation. It's all based on this non-judgmental awareness. And we're using that tool to deepen our capacity for focus. Today, we're using uh, 
focal objects like calm or like uh, the breath with a count. And that's what we're about. So, seem, seem right? Seem like what we've done so far this morning? Okay, that's your review, and it lets me shift my little neurology into what we're into now, which is we're going to do a couple of sessions of meditation back to back. Hooray! So what I'd like to do with you is our first session, we will do our 21 breath count um, because it's familiar, and so we can ride that momentum and take it even a little bit deeper. And then we'll come up out of that and I'll introduce another method to you um, so that we can also play with, with a few different things. And, and those cons, the uh, insights born of that method will, will make up some of the conceptual things we'll do later. So let's get after it, shall we? Please find whatever kind of props you might need to sit comfortably. I'm actually gonna add a cushion to my seat here because it's gotten harder. This, this seat somehow got harder as the morning went by. So yeah, maybe, maybe it was my butt that got harder as the morning went by, you never know, stay hydrated. Okay, so find your seat. You may need to light an incense, whatever. All, that's all the earth element stuff. And this is also the barley seed of our very miniature retreat, which is the meditation itself. Right, so as you start to settle in, that's part of your meditation. Okay, let's do um, orienting with eye movement. So this was in our last course, but basically gaze around for a moment and then let your eyeballs find a spot that looks interesting or neutral to them. Like you'll have this feeling like, oh, my eyes would like to stay there for a moment. And you can just enjoy those qualities. Like for me, it's a quality of neutrality. Uh, it's quite enjoyable, but you might have something that looks really beautiful. You know, whatever it is that draws your eye. And you'll stay as long as you feel that. And then if you feel the urge to move on, and let your eyes seek around and find something else that's intriguing to them. So this time I found an object which is beautiful to me. So I can, oh, wow, I can enjoy that. And then in this round, my eyes want to move on more quickly. So you go at your pace, but it's following that inner guidance. Letting the eyes find something. And maybe do one more little round of that if you want. You're also welcome to bring that to completion at any time. Just letting your eyes find any object that they land on. It seems interesting to them, enjoyable to just land on. Good, then you can bring your gaze back to the center, our classic meditative posture. Uh, in the ancient text, they often say, look at the nose, but the, it's a cue, which actually means look down the angle of your nose. And this will give you the angle of your eyes that tends to help calm the mind. And then your eyes could be half open at that angle, or they could be closed. And take a moment just to be aware, body, breath, and mind. And then we will start our engines. We'll start that inner method of counting 
from one through 21 on the exhales and all the way back down.
Okay, then staying in meditation, but letting go of the counting. Take a moment just to be curious, mindful. Similar to what we did with the eye movement, just letting your mind notice whatever it notices about your present moment experience. And then you can even let that go. And gradually give rise to the intention to integrate this particular meditative session. And begin to move back from any deep or removed places your awareness might have gone to and back toward the interactive or the more concrete bringing those subtle and causal realm experiences back into the grounded, gross realm. As you do so, you can begin to deepen the breath, maybe even move the body a little. Oh. Mm. And we'll bring that session to completion. Wow. Okay, so just a couple minutes conversation, and then we'll do one more session, uh, right, as we're staying in this momentum. Just a little check-in. How are we doing? I see one uh, confetti emoji, so this is good. I'll take that as a good sign, either Either it was a great meditation or a manic episode has just ensued, ensued but hopefully great meditation. <laughs> All right, Jim, what do you say? Question, comment, insight? He's in the transcendent, I can tell. I noticed that in the middle, I completely lost the count. Mm. It couldn't count anymore. Mm -hmm. It just, I had to bring, come back up. Yeah. To continue counting because I dipped, I, it seemed like I dipped so low that counting wasn't accessible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> counting yeah. was not accessible. So in order to continue to count, I had to actually bring my consciousness back up. Yeah. Beautiful. And this is one of the things that I love about doing a little intensive meditation and doing it together is we'll often hear um, pieces that are very specific aspects of the meditative path as taught, like in this case, um, in the Buddhist. Um, see, now I'm in the beyond. Hold on. Um, in the Buddhist stages of meditation. Um, one of the things they have you at this stage that we're at, once you can hold the mind relatively steady on an object, then they say, now learn to moderate uh, dullness and agitation, dullness and agitation. And one of the things that happens is that uh, I forget exactly the order, and I don't think it's the same in everyone, but um, as we learn to focus the mind, the agitation factor calms down. And then the danger is that you'll slip into torpor, right? Um, and so they say to do exactly what you uh, found out is that you have to bring the mind up. So you're learning to distinguish between quiescence and dullness. And um, it's, really, it's really quite cool. And that's also a good reason why a couple different styles of meditation to experiment with can be really helpful because 
going into that state during like a yoga nidra practice, that's just not a problem. Just go, <laughs> go all the way down, baby. Um, but you might, um, your yoga nidra practice might never get to that full like Turiya um, unconditional witness state if it's too dull, you know? And so then you practice and you're sitting up practice and um, you get to experience these different aspects of your mind. So that's pretty neato. Yeah, pretty neato. Thanks for sharing that. What else, anything else to insight or a question or any problems? I wanna make sure we're not having any problems. This is, in case you are a beginner, this is a little more intense than, um, than I would do in like a beginner practice. Like, okay, here, back to back keep them going. Um, so just be aware, take care of yourself. Um, but these are pretty benign meditation methods. And so most of us can get away with them. Yeah. And then in the comments, that was easier than the first time, able to drop much deeper. Yeah. And me too. I finally got to some of the, some of the states that I don't usually get to unless I'm in retreat. You know, there's, there's daily meditation, pretty groovy. Um, but then there's only when you get a couple hours rolling, are there certain mental states uh, that come into play. So I think a lot of value judgments in my inner experience. Yeah, interesting to witness. Wow, what a great segue too, because we are about to move into some witness, witnessing the interior, interior as some of our next work. So you're right on time. Thank you for keeping us on schedule. How great. Okay, so that was the 21 breath count, and um, it's a favorite of mine. That style of meditation um, has at times been my regular daily practice, um, so I highly recommend it personally because you can do a lot with that, and uh, if you become a meditation teacher, if you become a coach helping people learn to meditate, um, I have found that one to be a lot easier for beginners then when you go in there, like, just focus on your breath. And if you've got, I mean, there are some people I've, I've learned recently, there are some people who don't have an inner dialogue. It's just not a thing for them. And I was like, what? Because most of my life, I don't not have an inner dialogue. Like that's a, unless I'm meditating on purpose, like, it's, we got shit to talk about in there, baby. So, um, so I wonder, like, maybe those folks who don't have an inner dialogue for them, when they now sit down, quiet your mind, and just breathe, and they're like, okay. <laughs> um, but for many of us, many of us, wow, how cool. Um, we need a little something more for the mind to do so that it can drop into quietude, so that it can drop into quietude. And so um, what you'll often begin to experience as, if you did this method or methods like it is that we have that foreground of attention and it's like a spotlight or something and it's, it's on the counting of the breath. And then in the beginning stages, outside the spotlight will be a bunch of stuff going on you know, shopping lists and multi-generational trauma and uh, political midterm elections and, you know, uh, ice cream advertisement from Baskin Robbins from 1983 or whatever, you know, it's all there. And then slowly by slowly, you'll start to have moments of experience where there's a spotlight on the breath and the rest of the field of attention is just sort of open, right? Um, and then in between there, usually you'll, ha you'll have that for a moment. And then there will be like less, like instead of an ice cream ad and a midterm election campaign, there will just be one at a time. <laughs> and slowly by slowly, the mind comes to settle. Um, so for a lot of people, having a real definite object to foreground with your awareness helps. And the breath is such a... Um, it's not exactly definite, right? It's going in and out and you could track it at your nose, but you could tra also track it at your tummy, but you could also track it at your throat. Some breaths are long, some breaths are short. And if you're a person with one of these type of active minds, it's, it actually can be really 
difficult to let the mind rest on such a dynamic object. Um, one other thing you might want to know if you're coaching people, um, you know, either eventually in your profession as a yoga teacher or just a, a buddy who's learning to meditate and confiding in you, um, in the realm of trauma-informed meditation, somatic objects are often um, more likely to trigger a person. So objects that are of focus that are inside or about feeling, if you have unresolved feeling stuff, that's where you can get things that get uncomfortable, right? Um, and discomfort is not the enemy, but we want to we want to titrate how much discomfort we're experiencing. So objects that are external or conceptual can be easier at those first stages where we're trying to get resource, we're trying to get settled. Um, whereas somatic objects of meditation um, might be more difficult if there are unresolved issues, whether we know them or not, whether we know them or not. So this, it's interesting to me because I wonder how many people are in, you know, they're in a meditative retreat, you know, and they tell the teacher, oh, I'm just, I'm feeling so uncomfortable. And like, how much of that is the resistance we should expect with learning to focus the mind versus how much of that is like traumatic material surfacing. And if you had the right container for that, you could do a ton with it. Or if you had the right meditation, you wouldn't have to go through so much discomfort. You could just relax through the whole freaking retreat and not have to like, <sighs> I've been to some yoga retreats, man, where, you know, you come back and people are like, oh, how was your yoga retreat? I wish I, and you're like, bro, you weren't in the battlefield I was just in with my mind. All right. And it's nice to know, like, if you have the right technology, you could go on a meditation retreat and have it just be restorative. And that's perfect. You don't have to work everything out and transcend everything. And often what we're finding is meditation is the wrong freaking tool for that. You should do that in therapy. And meditation should augment that or should, you know, let you glimpse beyond transegoic states and things like that. Um, so anyway, it's just, don't, don't get me started. We've got to go back into a, another session. But all this is to say, breath counting method is a pretty good method for most folks. It's a pretty good method for most folks because it's not, it, it's somewhat in the body, but your real object is that number, right? You're not, how does the breath feel when it goes in? You know, you're, you're not quite going there. Um, and so you don't, um, like if you were leading a, a class or something, you're less likely to trigger folks who are ready to be triggered and then, you know, have to deal with that or not be able to deal with that or something like that. So it's, it's a little more benign. And for busy minded types, it's a, it's a nice definite thing and you can track your progress. You can see how able was I to count to 21 up and back, um, and, and that can be pretty nice, especially for like kind of type A minds and stuff like that to stay invested in their meditative progress. So that was that. So now we're going to do something more difficult for some, more fun for others. And uh, we're going to do a much more formless practice on the breath. What I'd like to do in this session is we'll do a half and half and I'll, um, I'd like to introduce to you both methods right now. Um, and then we'll, again, we'll do another little 24 minute chunk. So uh, the first method I wanna teach or uh, offer you is the box breathing. Has anyone here done box breathing before? Okay, very simple, easy pranayama, and most of us have done it. Um, not all people like this. I've. When I learned box breathing, I thought it was God's gift to humanity. And so I just taught it as if everyone would like it. Some, some of us, it makes uncomfortable. So uh, you don't have to do box breathing if you don't want. Um, but let's, while we're getting prepped, let's do a couple triangle breaths. So triangle breathing is where you're going to exhale. And let's do a four count, right? So you're going to exhale, two, three, four. And then you hold it out, two, three. Four, then you inhale. Then you're gonna exhale, two, three, four, pause it out. 
and inhale. Exhale. Pause. Inhale. And exhale. Pause. One more time, inhale. And breathe naturally. Ah. Okay. So that one um, may have been a little fast as I'm noting my own breath. That pace was a little fast for me to be able to relax uh, personally. Um, and I find the triangle breath is a, it's a little dynamic. I don't know. It's like a waltz instead of a march or something because it's, it's on a three count um, just in how it affects me. But for some other folks, triangle breath will be really relaxing because the exhaled breath holds. Um, there's a Sanskrit word for that, but I forget what it is. The exhaled breath holds are, they put a little less pressure on your cardiovascular system than an inhaled breath hold. Um, that's part of why, like if you study Wim Hof, you know, you hyperventilate and then you hold the breath out for a really long time. And then you breathe in. And at least for beginners, you hold the breath for a little bit, but not for very long. And then you hyperventilate again because um, that exhaled breath hold, I don't know if that's what he's thinking, but it's, it's a good system in that way. That exhale breath hold is a little less stressful on your cardiovascular system um, in terms of like blood pressure increases and stuff like that. So sometimes the box breathing, because you're going to inhale, pause, exhale, pause, hmm. Um, sometimes that inhale pause will make people a little nervous, um, a little pressurized. So for them, they might enjoy the triangle breathing. And so I offer that to you in this class in case you want to experiment with it. Um, of course, you've always got the two one breath, which is just the best pranayam for your vagus tone, vagal tone um, around and natural breathing. But for our session, what I'd like to do is, is about half the time we'll do box breathing, or if that's not something that you enjoy, then do whatever method you like. And the second half, we will do the, um, we'll do mindfulness of breathing with the pattern interrupt of, if you find yourself thinking, you'll say to yourself, thinking. So it looks like, it sounds like this on the in, inside. I wonder if I'm doing this right. Thinking. And then what often will happen, because well, we're going to set it up, we're going to do a big round of this box breathing. So the mind will be uh, relatively quiet. Um, is that you go thinking and that drops you into the observer instead of the thinker and the mind will go quiet for a minute. And so in that quiet space, you go, ah, breath, breathing, ah, breathing in. Um, and you're watching the mind. Some texts say like a cat at a mouse hole. Like, mm -hmm. And then if it thinks, you go, ah, thinking. And um, I like playing it that way because it's not like you're going like, ah, thinking. No, it's my thinking. There, there it went. It did it. And then you, you let the whole thing go quiet. You go back to your object, the breath. Um, you enjoy the breath in that spaciousness because what you've done, basically, we're, the, you're using the word thinking, but what you're doing is you're highlighting the witness you foregrounded this observer consciousness and you get to rest in that for a minute after you startle the mind <laughs> with your little mantra. So um, this is how we're going to set it up. We'll do the first half of our session, about 12 minutes, box breathing or any method that helps to relax you. Um, this, is, this is part of the, um, the yogic philosophy that they say, if you can get your pranas um, harmonized, the mind will quiet on its own, right? So they put a big, that's why you do yoga postures and stuff is if you can get the body parked, you're halfway to mental quietude. Then if you can get the breath rhythmic, the mind will quiet even more. 
And so then when we do these methods where it's like, okay, you're going to say thinking and the mind will go still. That's not often true for folks, but if you prep yourself, you have a really great chance of having a, having that be wonderful um, practice. So to have the practice box breathing or whatever, then we'll do, it's going to be just basic mindfulness of the breath. I'll kind of lead you into that. Um, you can be mindful of your breath at your nose or at your tummy or anywhere you feel your breath. All of those are, are fine options. And breathing, breathing, breathing. If the mind starts chattering at you, you say thinking and come back to your breath. The last thing that you might want to be aware of is if, if that is too spacious for you, um, this is where some schools will say to say to yourself, breathing in when you breathe in and to say to yourself, breathing out when you're breathing out. So that's kind of like a bridge between um, having kind of a conceptual verbal meditation object and a somatic meditation object. So that works better for some folks. So this is your intro. Try to remember, is there anything else I was supposed to say? The last thing. So I will use a four count for my box breathing personally. And if you have a sacred phrase or a mantra that you can use for your four count, um, that's that's an old Sufi method to uh, to harmonize the, they say, not only are you rhythmatizing the bodily pranas, but by saying a prayer on each breath, you're making them sweet. You're, ma you're making the winds of the body sacred. So um, I'll often use this Sufi uh, slogan that they say, toward the one, toward the one toward the one, only slower than that, toward the one. Um, you could do, if you like the Tibetan stuff, you could do Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, or Om Bhadra Sattva Hum, Om Bhadra Sattva Hum, or Hail Mary Full of Grace, or whatever your sacred tradition is. Um, so four count works really well, but as long as your breaths are even, it's box breathing. So you could do Om Vajra Sattva Hum, Dra Sattva Hum, et cetera. And you could do it on a six or you could do it on an eight. I find that's all too dang complicated. So I use something that's a four and I'd recommend toward the one if you don't have something else you want to use. So there we are. Find your posture. Spine upright. Try to balance right through that central column. Park the body. Gaze down. Let's do a couple of those double breaths where we exhale naturally and then you push the breath out. So you're really emptying, 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 and then you inhale naturally. If you like, you can imagine when you exhale, like you're exhaling smoke, it leaves the body, carrying out tension away from you, and then you push the breath out. When you inhale, you could imagine like you're inhaling light or like the blue, blue sky. Let's do one more of those. And then settling in, take just a moment of mindful awareness, just hosting, witnessing awareness. How is it with my body? How is it with my breath? How is it with my mind? And then whenever you're ready, you can try that box breathing, which is inhaling, then pausing, and exhaling, and then pausing all with the same count.
as before, take note of the mind. Your object is just keeping the count with that breath. And especially useful if you have a sacred phrase. It's necessary, just bring your mind back to that sacred phrase and the counting of the breath. And gently let go of that patterned breathing. 
Let the breath flow naturally for a moment. Just take a moment of mindful awareness, noticing whatever is. So when you're ready, notice where you can feel your breath moving in and out of the body. And notice where you can feel that most strongly. Is it at your nostrils? Is it at your belly? And wherever you feel that breath moving, most strongly, easiest to set your mind on. We're just going to rest the mind on the breathing. Very relaxing object of meditation. A thing to do, but watch the waves roll in and out. As the mind watches the breath, there's also a part of the mind that watches the mind watching the breath. And if you notice the mind get swept up into inner dialogue or planning or fantasies or dreams, you'll simply say thinking and then come on back to the breath.
then gently letting go of that exclusive focus on the breath. And just resting again in mindful awareness. Noticing body, breath, and mind. Then having the intention to integrate this practice we've just done. Let's finish with the double breathing. So just like before, you exhale, and at the end, you exhale more. If you like, you can even imagine that cloudy smoke leaving the body, clearing stagnation. When you inhale, you're inhaling luminosity. couple rounds, and then inviting your mind to make the transition back toward an interactive state. Let the breath deepen. When you're ready, you can let the gaze rise up, and we'll complete that practice. Oh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. All right. Well, there we are. Practice session number six of the day. That's our that's our fifth uh, kind of fuller fuller length practice session. So uh, hopefully that was enjoyable for you or not. It was what it was, and the next one will likely be totally different. So uh, make sure not to make an ego identity out of however that went, because it will be a bummer to have to dismantle that uh, next time. Just leave it dismantled. Uh, you know, it'll be better off, less work. So uh, how was that practice for you? Any questions or insights? Was it different? Was this your favorite, your least favorite? Um, what, what can we say about this practice? Let's see, four point money mantra, yeah. So that's nice. Did anybody else like the box breathing that we started with? How was that for you? Box breathing fans. So we got one not a fan. We got a havesy havesy. Yeah. Um, I've had times in my life where I really loved the box breathing. Today wasn't my jam, you know? So, uh, okay, we got, so we got a couple of fans. Excellent. And um, these, these may go through cycles for you. Um, you may also find what I failed to mention um, was that you can do those mantras without a breath hold. Um, so you could do Om Mani Padme Hong out, Om Mani Padme Hong in, Om Mani Padme Hong out. Um, and that's really quite nice. Um, it's a really nice practice. So um, highly recommend it. We may not have time to try that out today, but... I want to make sure to mention it because that's that's one for years and years that was my practice was that harmonizing the breath and I learned a lot about meditation just from doing that with with Sufis so um, it's a really cool they'll do um, la ilaha on the out breath illa la hu on the in breath so they're chanting to themselves nothing there's nothing at all except for the divine. There's nothing, at all, but they're using the timing, the breath. Um, and it seems to kind of put your body mind into rhythm. So that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Box breathing plus mantra. Let's, let's go. So, you know, some days it'll be good. Um, 
you know, other days, if you do enough yoga, you'll like it. You know, like for me today, I probably needed to move a little more before I put pressure on my uh, inner meridian network through doing breath holds. Um, so there's all this kind of stuff. Okay. And then what about our second half was the mindfulness of breathing and saying, thinking, was that anybody's favorite or least favorite or mediocre? Let's see. Oh, good. We got, we got one fan of that one. We got, I don't know, everybody's afraid to say or something like that. Mediocre, this is my guess, my guess. What do you say, Jim, and then Jake? I, I Again, I got lost on that one. Uh -huh. I just kind of drifted away, no thoughts, just boom, mm -hmm. drifted away. Yeah. And then, um, um, it kind of went, oh, I'm supposed to be thinking. No, not thinking, no. <laughs> and it got a little um, chaotic for a moment and it just just brought it back down. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it sounds almost like, um, like there was a little bit of a double bind for you in the instructions. <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, you're not thinking, wake up. Oh, now I'm thinking. No, stop thinking. You know, and uh, there you go. Zen koan meditation for you. So, uh, but all the all experience is good. So, yeah. What else? Other other thoughts on this one? Thoughts. <laughs> What's your thinking on the thinking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, inter interrupting the incorrect idea of thinking with enthusiasm was a good pivot. Yeah. Um, so this is, if you can, if you can get it, um, this is one where, you know, in, instead of going, oh, I'm thinking, stop that, come back to the breath. You just go, ah, thinking, there, that's what I've been looking for. I found one. And um, it helps to kind of train the presence of awareness that we are looking for. Um, this one wasn't my favorite today, but it was um, illuminating. I'll, I'll say that for mine. So I, I got a lot of uh, good kind of mental training, even though the method sort of keyed me up a little bit, you know, so rather than finding the sweet spot, it was a little like, all right, thinking, breathing, thinking. Uh, that was my inner experience, um, but definitely got to observe some fun fun things in there. So this is a method, again, that you could come back to, or, you know, not all methods are for all people. That's why there are, according to Buddhism, there are 84,000 ways of spiritual practice. Um, and it's because we bring a unique body mind, we bring a unique neurology. Um, and the practice in terms of, of yogins, the practice is whatever's, whatever's going to get you to the next degree of integration, right? It's not about doing the right meditation. It's what's, you know, so if you're, um, if you're in distress and you've got a mind that doesn't like to focus and that's causing all this distress, just learning a method that brings a little bit of ease is the, it, just do that for the rest of your life. Like no problem, you, you don't have to go and do all this other stuff, um, but we do in this course, we'll get a number of experiments that you can play with, see what might be right for you or to have some things if that, you know, if you're like, okay, reaching a plateau, sometimes you can switch it up uh, and get new insights. So that was the deep part of our barley seed. We came in, we chatted a little bit, and we did a couple of meditation sessions before lunch. We did lunch, we did, oh, a couple of meditations on the other side. We're going to take our, uh, let's take a 10 minute break because we're almost done with our day, actually. And um, take a break. If you can, move around a little bit um, just to keep yourself in motion. And then we will chat, we'll do some lighter practices, and we'll finish at about five. So I'll see you in 10 minutes, 410 Pacific. Welcome back. Welcome back. We are in our final rounds here. Just look at my notes while I give everybody a chance to make sure they are here. 
water, things, stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, cool, right on track. Okay, well, oh, did you do some Qigong on your break, Jim? Excellent. That's on my schedule for after class, after class. Before, before dinner is my Qigong time. It's the best, it's the best time for Qigong. All right, so we're doing pretty good in our uh, goals for today. So this is module two. This is how the Tibetans always teach. You know, they, they start all the way at the beginning and hopefully, like I hope for myself, you, you get a truncated version every time, but they're like, so there are 84,000 dharmas. Then along came the Buddha and he taught one called Buddhism. And then within Buddhism, there's Indo-Tibetan Buddhism. And within that, there's the Kagyu school. Within the Kagyu school, there's the Shangpa Kagyu school. And within the Shangpa Kagyu school, there are the teachings of Lady Naguma. Today, you know, and you finally get down to it. So uh, pardon me having a, accidentally adopted that method, but we're in the compassion alchemy system and it has five elemental stages it's a work in progress don't judge me too harshly send me constructive criticism in in nonviolent communication style if you like um and our first module is the earth module which has to do with grounding pleasure savoring resourcing um, and those all happen to conveniently cover the basics of meditation stuff like clean your room shut off your phone make an altar um, if you were setting up a retreat, it's the same thing. You know, you delineate the retreat space. You make healthy boundaries. You make the place comfortable. You put enough mung beans in the kitchen for the week of your retreat or whatever it is. You get off coffee so your mind's not whirling. Um, all of that sort of setting the ground or the groundwork, we could say, is the earth element. And it's also um, related to that developmental stage of gaining secure attachment, these most fundamental needs. Um, one of the things I was just talking about with my mentor, so as we get into kind of where the developmental stage is for water, um, one of the inspirations behind this system was, as I mentioned earlier, it came up while I was teaching my intermediate students um, coaching skills, communication coaching skills. So, um, with part of being a Qigong teacher um, on that advanced level, you have to learn how to coach because then you're a then you're a coach and your people are going to be going through transformations and stuff like that. And let me tell you, if you don't know how to do nonviolent communication or something with a different name that is the same thing, and you're and people start going through trans transformations, you're gonna have a lot of miscommunications, man. Um, and so it's good to have some of these basics. So one of the things that I found um, for many, many years of um, formally being a communication coach or having these type of communication um, moments in uh, relationships is that one of the hardest things for people to get is how to distinguish between observations and assessments. How does distinguish between observations and assessments? So for example, um, observation, the wind is blowing. Assessment, what a nice day. Or how do you know that's a, an, an assessment? Because somebody who um, is of a different constitutional type, maybe in the same climatic conditions, and they say, oh, the wind is blowing. What an awful day, right? Because when the wind blows, their vata humor gets out of whack and they feel nervous and they can't meditate. Whereas you, you know, you're all stagnant and, and have liver chi stagnation and you're hot. And so the breeze blows and you're like, oh, thank God, I can finally meditate. Breeze is blowing. So one is the fact of the matter. And then the other is what we think about that. Um, this stage in human development is actually, it's a part of our maturation. I remember, um, I think it was probably in fourth grade, we had a class on like fact versus opinion. Did anybody get a class like that in elementary school 
I don't know, I think it was part of creative writing or something like that, you know, like facts versus opinions. And if you want, if you want a terrible kind of fun, maybe it's not fun, watch some clips from the current um, political debates for the midterm elections for like governor and senator and senators and stuff. And you will see a number of people who need to retake that fourth grade class because they're presenting opinions, assessments, projections, and sometimes absolute hallucinations or lies, or you know, there's a nefarious side to this too, um, that some people are intentionally using skillful communication to mislead you. But a lot of the time you can, you can sort of tell that people just assume that what they think something is, is what it is. <sighs> So in teaching communication, in facilitating communication for a long time, one of the things I realized is that one of the hardest parts for people to, to get, like, you know, I would coach couples in, you know, trying to have a, get through a tough spot in their relationship or something like that. And one of the stickiest parts would be to say, to learn to say something like, when you don't text me back for more than an hour and a half, I feel lonely good and but instead they would say why are you always abandoning me i feel abandoned by you which if you have a skillful partner to hear that no problem oh let me see let me see if i get what you're saying um but the i'm being abandoned is a story right there unless they actually packed up and left. And you were also a powerless person who, without your own agency, you haven't literally been abandoned. You Something happened and you felt a certain way about it. And we tend to confuse which one is which. I, I have an interpretation of events. And there are also the events which I am interpreting. Okay, so this is, um, it's important to me to teach in, in this kind of spiritual um, venue of meditation because this is big time in spiritual communities as well, that um, people will project their intuitions on you as if they were fact, and it's almost worse in spiritual communities because people have trained to feel into and believe their intuition you know i'm a sovereign being with my intuition and my intuition said you've been thinking this about me and i am not gonna have it i was like did you bother to check right so um it can be really important to have in our system of spiritual transformation something that awakens our intuition and also makes us better able to distinguish what are the facts of the matter and what are the hallucinations that I am adding to the facts of the matter. Okay, and so this is, this is the water element because this is what happens when that water element dissolves right, is that things get dreamy and they get murky. And this in um, the yogic traditions, this is where dream yoga comes into play. Um, actually, one of the ways you could use this is if you learn to be a lucid dreamer, um, you can learn to be a lucid waker, which is, it's, it's, it's almost backwards of, of what one might think, that like you learn how to wake up while you're asleep and go like, wait a minute, that polka dot elephant seems suspicious. Is this a dream? And then it, for the first couple of months, you'll just wake up in the middle of the night the minute you say that. But eventually you can learn to stay in the dream and go, oh, this is a dream. I'm going to fly with that polka dot elephant. Let's go, Dumbo. You know, and have a hell of a lot of fun. And you're lucid dreaming. And how they leverage that is they say, now what you just did while you were asleep Learn to do that while you're supposedly awake, 
or while your brain is in alpha and beta waves instead of alpha, theta, and delta waves, right? Um, so the, the dream yoga piece here, which is really important for this water element, is to recognize how much of our experience is fantasy and interpretation. How much of our experience is fantasy and interpretation? Um, or, so that's, uh, you can hear kind of my Zen bias coming in, right? Because in, uh, in Zen practice, you know, you'll do a retreat and you have an interview with the teacher. And a lot of us, you know, young new age kids, you know, we'll have a really good meditation. And we'll come and I, wow, I saw this light and I heard this tone and then I was really calm. And the teacher will be like, ah, hallucinations, go back and sit down. And we'll be like crestfallen because we thought that was the point was to have some, have some of this crazy stuff going on. Um, but why they might call that hallucination is because we're grasping onto those things with our meaning maker. We're grasping onto those. So we see a light in the meditation. And then what happens is our ego that longs to be somebody special, let's say in my case, um, longs to be somebody special, totally below the radar goes, oh, I saw the light in meditation. 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 You can emphasize any of those words and make an ego poem about it, right? And then also totally below the radar is that we'll start to spin out like, well, what does that say about me then? What's that gonna mean for my future? Am I gonna be a great meditation teacher? Have I found the path that's going to liberate others from suffering? Oh, and all of that is bullshit. It's all just absolute, just hokum. That, there's a good euphemism, so I don't have to say the, the, those swear words. That's a bunch of hokum. Um, and so if you're doing that in the zendo and the, and the teacher like senses the chi of it, it's actually not that hard to, to be kind of esoteric about now that I dissed intuition. Your teacher senses that you're, they'll come and they'll whack you with a stick because you need to just snap out of it, dude. Because the real sort of awakening experiences don't have to do with, oh, what does this mean about me two weeks from now? They have to do with what is now. And so there's a real learning in meditation and communication of learning to distinguish what are the facts of the matter what's present and what am i adding on top of that experience okay so that's kind of the like the the zen bias is like oh yeah you made made up stuff um from a more tantric or non-dual yogic meditators perspective it's not necessarily bad news because this is your capacity for meaning making and the only problem with that is that we normally do that totally unconsciously so we're wandering around and you know let's say i i probably usually pick on jim or something but let's say during class you know jim like makes a face like this right and unconsciously my meaning maker who really wants to be somebody special you guys ah, that would be so cool you know might say like oh no did I say something wrong? What's that going to do to my possible specialness? If Jim, you know, this trained psychologist doesn't think I'm special, because you can tell because he looked like Popeye just then, then what does that mean for my future? And the mind can spin out. And then as it's doing that, right, my kidneys are going to start pumping out cortisol and epinephrine, and my amygdala is going to shut down my prefront, all like real physiological stuff is going to be happening to an absolutely imagined threat. Like the threat was totally imagined, but I, I used my meaning maker to make myself sick in the future, right? To slightly make myself sick now, make myself sick in the future. Um, and the whole problem is I don't know that I'm making that meaning. I have failed to interpret the dream of, oh, Jim hated me because I don't have anything good to say because my life's going to shit and it was a waste the whole time. And I don't know about you, but these things can spiral. Um, I don't know you do it yourself, but 
I bet your friends do. Um, and all we got to do, you know, the beginning of the process is to be able to recognize, wait a minute, I'm making meanings right now. I'm making meanings right now. Or the mantra. So this is your out-of-pocket practice uh, that we did in one class that some of the students really got a lot out of, which is a, it's a dream yoga practice. And it's at any time during your day, just to say to this, say to yourself this phrase, this is a dream. This is a dream. It's a, it's, a, it's a lucid dreaming practice because if you say that to yourself often enough during the day, your subconscious will repeat it to you at night and you're likely to actually wake up in your dreams, which is fun. You, know, you can fly with Dumbo. It's pretty cool. Um, but in, and then there are some sort of more extreme yogic versions of that, which I am not recommending in this class, which are, um, they have, so the best versions of them, in my opinion, have to do with like a holotropic vision of the universe, right? That, you know, quant quantum consciousness is like entangled and we're like, we're meaning making ourselves and others into existence on this like subatomic level. And then in that, everything you see is an illusion, right? Okay, but don't do that one. Don't do that one. <laughs> do the one where as you're walking down the street, unless you're just totally present with scenery, the contents of consciousness, the feelings in your body, the stories and the, and the trips and whatever, but anytime that you're not primarily seated in presence itself, you are dreaming. And so you say to yourself, ah, this is a dream. This is a dream. And then just like lucid dreaming, you don't have to stop dreaming. Like it's fun, like go be Peter Pan for a while and Tinkerbell and stuff, right? And the, the Tibetan texts are actually cool like that. They're like, yeah, once you wake up, you should go to temples and you should fly to the other side of the room and you should make water appear and then fire appear and all the elements. And then once you've gotten that out of your system, then you should invoke mystic masters and exemplars and mythic heroes from the tradition and have them teach you. How do we go? Now, once you've got that out of your system, then wake up in your sleep and dreams and do your meditation practice. And so they've got, they're like, they're not like, oh, this is a dream. And then like, now you have insomnia. This is a dream. And then you use the dream, man. That could be cool. So the same thing in uh, lucid waking is we catch ourselves when we're, when we're not in the realm of facts. The basic fact of, ah, oh, that's the feeling of my body now. The basic fact of, oh, that's the sound of my thoughts chattering on. But I'm identified at least somewhat as presence having these thoughts, having these emotions, right? Um, that's an experience of wholeness rather than you can, you can tell usually in hindsight that it was a dream because our thoughts or our emotions are often experiences of partiality. They say, I'm being abandoned, therefore I'm incomplete, therefore I must blank for things to be okay. And we want to wake up from those dreams because we could also seat ourselves in, oh, things are fundamentally okay. And I would like more attention from my romantic partners. Like that's also an option. And it doesn't involve the same type of suffering that the dream of abandonment, the dream of betrayal, the dream of whatever, you know, the facts may be, you know, the facts may be, oh, this is not the right partner for me. <laughs> And the good news is like these waking practices, they don't mean that you just become okay with whatever crummy situation is out there. You actually tend to become more lucid that that partner's not the one I want. That job is not the one I want. I could be doing this. If I'm making meaning, I'm not being thrown around by, you know, oh, I hate my job. I hate my job. And just, I'm, I'm just stuck in a cycle of making that meaning. You could go, okay, what are the facts? Oh, I don't like my pay rate. 
my, I've tried to ask my coworkers to speak kindly to me. They just don't. And I could do other things, right? And there's a quality of presence. That have, have you all experienced this? Like make, making decisions, real life decisions from when you're seated in that sense of like presence and wholeness versus when you're seated in that sense of like partiality there's almost a sense of urgency that comes from that one. we like, oh no, I have to change now. I have to yell at somebody. I have to call somebody. I have to break up with someone. I have to quit my job. I have to go back to college, you know, versus the capacity to go like, well, I could go to college or not because I'm, I'm settled in this wholeness. So, okay, what's all this theory about? Well, that's one of the skills that we are training our mind in when we practice being with the breath, witnessing when the mind starts to think and saying, thinking, and then coming back to the breath. So very few of us had that as our favorite practice today, but that practice or those like it, what they're doing is they're training us to settle into the felt sense of presence. Um, one author calls it the simple feeling of being, right? To settle into that felt sense of presence. And to, you don't have to obstruct the dreams that are coming up. You just don't confuse them for lucidity. Okay, so this is kind of fun because at that fourth grade, fact versus opinion le uh, level, this is a stage of our development around, you know, age eight to 10, um, where we're starting to first get the type of brain waves that can think in those terms. Um, according to the research, like in, in Piaget's work and stuff like that, you, you may have some internal dialogue before that. Um, you may have a sense of time before that, but it's not until like, like starting at five, but not really until you're like eight or 10 years old, do you have this timeline of memory within and this specific sort of inner dialogue where you can get really confused between dream and, and wake. Up until that time, it's like everything's kind of a fugue of dreaming and waking because of the type of brain waves you have as a kid. Um, and so at this point, we are moving in our development from earth element, right? Just nurture this kid. Just, just help him out, right? Uh, teach him some rules, get him grounded into starting to work with the mind, work with what's fact, what's fiction. This is where um, young people start to discern like, oh, wait, I talk to my invisible friend. You don't talk to my invisible. Oh, that's an internal reality but it's not an external reality. That's an internal reality, but it's not an external reality. And um, hopefully this is interesting to you, but it's really interesting to me on this path of meditation because this is one of the things that meditation can actually destabilize if you train it in, in ways that, that sort of rupture that. This is why I said like, don't do that version of dream yoga that's a specific instruction from some yoga masters of mine because they've seen their students go off the deep end because of deconstructing consensus reality. And that's not necessary to, to, to attain deeper states of, re, of meditation. Um, according to the best yogis I know, as far as I can judge them, um, med, spiritual awareness deepens through empathy and um, the ability to adopt more perspectives. So one of the things where we can go wrong is we try to reject gross reality. You know, oh no, those cars aren't there. My job's not there. I'm in a spiritual world or something like that. And so we're actually learning to adopt fewer perspectives. So um, meditative development is that you're learning to adopt, you know, let's say you're a white, cisgendered, uh, middle-aged man, you know, and one of the most important things you could do for your spiritual development is like to try to feel into the lived experience of people of different social locations than you. And man, will some of the bullshit 
that goes around yoga centers stop being part of your consciousness. Like you, you will have exorcised some real delusions that just came from only being in your social location. Um, and then similarly, we're advised to, to see, you know, what might the perspective be of someone who um, has quelled their mental afflictions? You know, we try to adopt that perspective and we, we gain a consciousness that's, that's more and more flexible and can actually share more experiences, can share more experiences. Okay, so um, developmentally, and then we'll do a couple little out-of-pocket practices, but you got your one. This is a dream. Just every so often, um, one Lama says, like, every time, train yourself every time you go through a door to say it. Um, that's one of the ones kind of more for the lucid dreaming at night. It's like, okay, every time you go through a door of any kind, you say, oh, this is a dream. And, you know, if you find that destabilizes your awareness, stop that. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, you're also advised not to mix this with uh, marijuana. Um, one of my llamas is very strict on this. Um, and I think it's because I, was, I just learned this research that um, those of us who have um, tendencies toward um, the manic side of the street or the schizoid type, type, side of the street um, are the ones who will tend to get paranoid or depressed or manic if you put almost any amount of cannabis into their system. It's just these genetic differences, right? So I don't know if it works the same for everyone, but um, one Lama from, from their experience has found that these meditative techniques that destabilize your relating to reality as concrete, plus taking uh, psychotropic agents that destabilize your relating to reality as concrete, you don't want to stack those because it will be too much of more of the same thing. So these are some of these kind of things, but this is a dream in general. When you're tripping out uh, is a great practice. When, when you're tripping on your partner, when you're tripping on the uh, your future, when you're tripping on your traumas, this is a dream. And then how do you want to use that meaning-making machine? Um, another great, I don't actually recommend them uh, wholeheartedly, but it's very similar to Byron Katie's The Work, The Work of Byron Katie, you know, and um, she's got like this series of questions, you know, a person will will come to them and, you know, let's say it's the, you know, oh, my partner is abandoning me all the time emotionally. And she'll say, is that true? You know, this is question number one. <laughs> and, you, and, and she'll kind of nail down the person like, is that true? How, how do you know? Can you absolutely know that that's true? And if you're honest, like, well, no, you, you can't absolutely know that that's true. You can know some of the facts. Um, and then one of her other questions is, you know, who, who would you be if you could never think that thought again or something along those lines? And it, um, that can be an extreme practice if you do it in a, in a weird way. But in terms of the dream yoga, if you're making meaning that causes you suffering, like let's say, you know, I had a recurring thought that said, oh, I'm a piece of shit. If I just couldn't ever have that thought again, my life would probably be super happy. And I wouldn't really lose anything if I could never think I'm a piece of, you know, because it's just a delusion, right? So you get to choose how you want to make your meaning. Um, this is also the realm of cognitive behavioral therapy is, is a much more evidence-based version of that. And they call these um, cognitive distortions. So it's important for us in this class just to think of a few of the major cognitive distortions. Um, Jim can help me out, I'm sure, but one of them is mind reading. So this is a great one if you have a, a buddy or an intimate partner, which is where you just assume, oh, they think this about me. Always a cognitive distortion, even if it turns out you were right. right? Anytime you're mind reading them, it's always coming through the filter of your projections. The law of shoulds. 
Yeah. So anytime you're relating to what's happening in life with a should on it, uh, I tried that, that thinking meditation, but you know, I didn't do really well. I should be a better meditator by now. Eh. This is a dream. This is a dream. You're, you're, you just should all over yourself, man. Um, so we're, we're looking to move from the realm of should to the realm of is, how is it? Oh, I didn't catch my mind as often as I'd like to. Oh, and you'll notice you don't have to generate any mental afflictions to say that, right? To be like, I'd like my mind to be quieter. Nope, not feeling any mental afflictions yet. It's only when my mind should be other than it is that you get the problem. Okay, what about um, black-white thinking? This is one of these, it's either this way or it's that way. Either, um, let's see, our team takes the house in the midterm elections or it's the apocalypse. And I won't, you can come to my Unitarian Universalist service tomorrow where I will tell you a message similar to that, but I'm gonna try to avoid cognitive distortions in it. Um, Cause you know, there, there are consequences to things. Some of them might be somewhat apocalyptic but it's where the mind assumes it's either this way or it's that way. Uh, that's also called all or nothing thinking, right? All or nothing thinking, rigid. Yeah, rigidity in our thoughts. And then um, universalizing, the, you know, this always happens to me. You're always like that. Um, anytime you have an always, you know, it's not an accurate statement. So you can kind of think anytime your mind is going, they think, she feels, he wants. Oh, mind reading. This is a dream. Anytime your mind goes, well, if this happens, then that must happen. Oh, wait a minute. That's black, white thinking. This is a dream. Oh, can't believe they didn't text me back. This always happens to me. Oh, universalizing. This is a dream. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm just giving you the quick little run through part of us this barley seed and hopefully because it's uh hopefully it is interesting to you but of course you could do more of this work on your own but what i want to introduce is on the spiritual path or on the path of human development this is one of the very important uh factors that we we have to get in or else you could go very high into the realm of hallucinations and seeing lights and meditation and even be able to like, I don't know, manifest Kung Fu iron shirt with mind over body, you know, stuff. You could raise and lower your body temperature and you would still be a totally delusional fool if you didn't get fourth grade level fact versus opinion, right? Um, and so you'll you'll see this in the Zen tradition. They, this is a big part of the meditation is actually analytical meditation. Um, and it goes right along with like good old Piaget's developmental um, stages. Okay, last thing to say on that, and then we'll do a closing practice and it'll be fun. I'll, I'll feel like I've given you the water element transmission uh, and um, that then you're on your own swimming, stand up paddle boarding, whatever you're doing with your water element. Um, so back to the nonviolent communication. One of the interesting things, just, just to think about in this developmental stuff, one of the reasons that people can't do these skills is that if you're triggered at the previous developmental level, so that earth element we said is like, oh, secure attachment stuff. If you've got a, a wound, developmental wound, let's call it, I don't know if that's a real word in psychology, but let's, let's say developmental wound and your partner seems like they're abandoning you, right? That's, that's the dream that's coming at you. And it triggers this early attachment need that was, wasn't quite fulfilled, right? You've got a wound there. It will be impossible for you to do nonviolent communication fact versus opinion stuff until you get that wound remedied or held or calmed down or cooled down. And this is such a, it's such a potent insight for me as a coach. Like 
in one way, understanding the limits of what I had to offer um, people who are in relational distress, because I'm there trying to teach them, okay, so when this comes up, try these protocols. And the protocols require you to be a fourth grader, but these are two-year-olds now, or one-year-olds or zero in, internally. The part that got triggered is, is zero years old and it just needs to be held. But unfortunately, the partner's triggered too, and they can't do that. And we're asking them to do these deep cognitive tasks of, hey, wow, sounds like you've really got some universalization. And you're saying that to your partner. Can you see how that's not cool? That's really kind of a jerk move. Stop that. And it's actually not possible. So the good news, why I should, it's intriguing to me, but the good news is when we do work on ourselves with this type of map, we're actually learning to set ourselves up for what capacities do I need to be able to do that fourth grade stuff in my relationships? Like if you took these four uh, modules, these little mini retreats, and you know you came out and you were like, huh, that's a thing. I, when I get into arguments, I can't distinguish fact and opinion. That would be a very honest thing of you to be able to recognize. Um, if you found that, you might go like, okay, do I need to work directly on the fourth grader? Or do I actually need to go a step back because I'm regressing into this um, attachment wound? And what you'll have is an introduction, at least to the type of meditative techniques that help us to work on those specific developmental tasks. So um, it's quite fun, right? If you, if you feel like, oh, I've got all my attachment stuff, but I do tend to project my fantasies on myself and others, and we all suffer for it, then you'll wanna go back and do that thinking or go back and do that, oh, this is a dream, right? Um, if you're fine to do that, as long as you're not triggered, but the minute you're triggered, you just become a two-year-old, then you'll wanna go back and do the resourcing and the calmative stuff. So it's really fun to have a map. Okay, that's a little talk on dream yoga. What do you think? Enjoyable, fun, groovy, boring? Okay, excellent. We at least got a majority of people who gave me some happy emoji. So um, I'm cool with that. Let's finish it off. So um, what, we, what we are getting, this whole matrix of what this uh, water element phase is, we are both learning to calm the mind more deeply and learn to focus and consolidate. We're also learning to be, once we have consolidated the mind, we become more clear or more reflective, you could say, whichever metaphor you want. Are you able to see the reflection of the moon or are you able to see through the water? And this is the aspect where the dream yoga comes in or the um, meditators CBT comes in that once we've gotten the mind to where it's, it's, non, it's a bit more non-reactive, we can actually take stock on what is fantasy either disaster fantasies or manic fantasies versus what's actually happening. And part of what's happening is my values. It doesn't just mean that you're gonna sit there in stasis for the rest of your life. Oh, nope, I'm only in the present moment. Everything else is a dream. No, you can long for a master's degree or you can long for a pastrami sandwich or something like that. Those longings are in the present moment. Um, it's only when you get to that I should have had a pastrami sandwich by now. This is a dream. This is a dream. So um, ultimately, we are working in this, um, the final piece on the developmental task, and then we'll do a very short practice about it, is could be called consolidating a, a healthy sense of self or consolidating a healthy individuality. Um, there's a lot more one could explore with this, but the main thing I wanna say in this context is it's the art of developing a healthy ego before you try to transcend ego altogether. Um, 
we run into a real problem when we tr try to just transcend ego altogether before we ever learned how to have one. Um, because instead of becoming trans-egoic, we tend to become pre-egoic. We tend to regress to infantile states. And people are so powerful, you can actually make yourself lose good adult skills by meditating your way out of them. <laughs> you, can, you can go through transformational uh, kundalini-ish processes and become a less integrated person by trying not to have an ego, right? Ego is a good thing for the middle of the road. It's not the end of the road, but it's an important bend in the road. So we wanna consolidate, here are my values, here are, here are the facts, here are the, here's the presence. And where we can tie this in um, with the work we've done today is that when we're learning to primarily seat ourselves in presence, when we're learning who's who's the blah, 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 automatic thinking versus who's the one that can go thinking, right? Or who's the one that can say that mantra with the box breathing? As we learn to settle into that identity, we come into a more sort of wholesome sense of I amness, or um, in the Zen tradition, they'll do a, a whole who am I? thing. Like sometimes once you learn to calm yourself down, then your next 10 years is to sit there and go, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Um, and you'll get to graduate when you can, when you can go to the teacher and they're like, okay, who are you? You know, it's been 12 years of going into the interview and them asking you this one day you'll go, I don't know. And they'll go, yes, that is who you are. But you can't fake it. If you try to fake it, you'll get hit with the stick. Um, so, um, but there's this sense of an I amness that is a that is a sort of a radiant source of your experience. It recognizes that you are the meaning making machine. We are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams, Charlie. Um, and this is related it's not the same as that fourth grade level of development but it's related on our on our sort of spiritual journey that before you dissolve the ego before you defrag the blah 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 is you want to consolidate this sense of this is me it's a good me it's a radiant field of presence so our last practice we're going to do a five minute meditation that uh, helps to just anchor that in so adopt your posture. If you can do an upright posture, that's great. Uh, sitting, standing, whatever, it's just a five minute practice. And we're going to use the Taoist uh, somatic method, which came through into Zen meditation, focusing on the lower belly, the Hara center, which in the yogic traditions, um, sometimes also called the navel center, it's related to this sense of I am, this, this who I am. And so in your inner awareness, see if you can feel your belly button. If you need to, you can even touch that with your hand and feel that belly button. And if the rest of the things I'll say are too subtle. You could always just go back and feel that belly button as this practice, no problem. But the more subtle version is from your belly button, just feel straight back to your spine. So feel the level of your spine that is opposite your belly button. And if you want, you could draw your hands around like a belt and touch that spot on your spine, just to give you a little marker. And then finally, take a moment and just feel your pelvic floor, the perineum, the very center of the pelvic floor. And see if you can feel these three points at the same time. 
which in itself is an energetic meditation. So your mind might go still as you do that. That's no problem. Enjoy it. But as you've made this kind of triangle, then right in the middle of that triangle, see if you can feel that space. It's almost like an empty space in the abdomen, below the belly button, but above the bladder. It's right in the center line of the body when we stacked ourselves up earlier. In alignment with gravity, that center line, right in the middle of this triangle. And that too is a whole meditation. You could just keep the awareness there. But for today, I want you to imagine a little beautiful pearl it's sort of just suspended in that space. It's bright, it's luminous, and it's got a pearly color. It's, it's that white color, but with a rainbow sheen to it. And imagine that this pearl down in the lower belly is spinning and spiraling in any direction it wants, just spontaneously moving and spinning. And have a sense that your awareness is anchored in this pearl. Like that's where you're perceiving or feeling from. And just do your best. Imagine that. That's not natural for everyone, but you might catch a glimpse or it might be natural to you. And then finally, see if you can bring up that quality, if anything was evoked when we were just talking about a sense of like a true self or a radiant self or this I amness before all of the other stuff gets added on, but the one who's making the meaning, just see if you can kind of anchor that, that that's what this pearl spinning in the lower belly represents. Feeling of basic presence. carries with it this feeling of groundedness and centeredness, of consolidation. And if you like that, you can leave that there. You can come back to awareness of that little pearl later in the day, or you could just let it dissolve into light as we finish that mini meditation. Deepen the breath for a couple of rounds. And come on all the way back to the we space so we can finish our retreat day. All right, my friends. So one final meditation. That would That's a very nice meditation to do for a full length session too, but um, we had time to do it for five minutes. So feel free to take those instructions and then go back. So now, if you've done the earth and the water, you know the basic science of taking a meditation object, resting the awareness on it, foregrounding it with awareness, staying there if the mind wanders, non judgmentally coming back, and teaching the mind to rest. Teaching the mind to rest are really what these first two stages are about. Um, with this second stage, having more of a sense of consolidation, consolidation. So there's more to do with that, of course, um, but that's the time we have in today's mini retreat. We did a lot of work, didn't we? I introduced the whole Compassion Alchemy system like three different times. Um, <laughs> and we did, we actually did some so we gained some cumulative energy in our meditation sessions. We learned about five different methods, which is kind of a lot, but uh, it didn't feel too cluttered to me. Hopefully it felt good to you. And uh, yeah, and we worked on consolidation and reflection. So our next 
course is on the fire element. And like before, these are cumulative. So as you saw today, built on that last module, but hopefully it also felt good as a standalone um, in case you weren't there or those of you who are watching later, um, in case this you decide to do this one first. Um, and so the same thing next time, it'll build on the momentum we have before and the skills that we have before. You'll get more out of it if you practice methods like these throughout the month. Um, but you could also jump right in and I'll try to make it um, an all levels class to the best of my ability. So with that, um, if you have any last minute questions, I will stay on for a couple minutes, but let's formally end our class by just bringing to mind those things we wanted to get, maybe assessing, did I get any of them? And whatever you got, cultivating a sense of savoring, gratitude, and then maybe even radiating those sensations out to anybody else in the world who wanted to get that today too. Imagine you could send it to them through these light ray sensations. All right, thank you so much for being here, giving me an excuse to meditate all day and helping me to work on this, this work in progress, Compassion Alchemy System. Uh, feel free to stick around and pop a question in or just say hi for a couple minutes. But otherwise, see you next time. Uh, there's no Facebook group for this retreat, but you can use, um, I think I saw you already using the comments in the course page, so you can use that. And then my um, general Facebook group, the temple style group on Facebook um, is a great way to talk about any of these programs that we're doing here. Cause a lot of the folks, will, the ones who are still on Facebook uh, will be in that group. So feel free to use that uh, for that too. Yeah, any other questions or comments or anything to say before we go? Anybody have any uh, pumpkin spice lattes yet this year? No, I saw some homies on TikTok that were like making their own, like with actual pumpkin. So it's not just like synthetic sugar, sugar stuff. You could make, get out the mocha pot and make a little espresso. And then they were like taking like pumpkin puree and it looked pretty good. So I don't know. I don't know. All right, this is a dream. See, see you in your dreams tonight with Dumbo maybe. And uh, other than that, we'll see you next month. Month five of no coffee, good gracious. Well, I'm on month two of no alcohol. So, <laughs> and you got a headbanger back there. What you doing? Uh, yeah, I'll be in Los Gatos tomorrow to Maybe preach in a sermon. Wow. Preaching a sermon. Maybe I'll see if I can drop by. That would be fun. I, I don't think I can make the, the sermon because I'm, I'm going to be up at CSC until at least noon. But um, I don't know how long you're going to be in town. Oh, um, well, I don't think tomorrow I'll be doing my meditation class usually, but usually on Sundays after the sermon, we'll do... We'll also do a sit. So maybe the following week, if you're into, into it. Uh, following week, I'm going to be with Marty. Oh, fun. Who, oh, by the way, says hi. Yeah. Send my regards. I, I will. I will. All right. Everybody left us. Yeah, I guess out of here. Dinner All time. Right. All right. Thanks for being here. See you in a month. See you Thank soon. Thank you very much.